So hi and welcome everyone to the Artificial Intelligence and in Energy webinar. My name is Rob and I'm the Online Community Manager with InnoEnergy. This webinar is brought to you by the InnoEnergy community. The InnoEnergy community is an open European-wide network of young professionals, entrepreneurs, students, and partners. There are over 2,000 members dedicated to sharing knowledge, uh, supporting and empowering each other, all to achieve a sustainable energy future through entrepreneurial and innovative activities. That's what the community is all about. If you aren't yet a member of the community platform, please take a moment to join uh, to get notified of future webinars, local events. Uh, you can share challenges that come up uh, in your work. You can write blogs like Jean-Luca has did with the Artificial Intelligence and Energy webinar series. Um, and yeah, this webinar is a culmination of a four-part blog series that Jean-Luca has written. Um, and I'll share the links in the chat here in a second um, in case you miss them. And so let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Jean-Luca Moro is an energy engineer turned entrepreneur that moved into data science. He fell in love with data science and artificial intelligence when he was living in Silicon Valley on a Fulbright scholarship, uh, also with the BEST program. Uh, Jean-Luc really said that that was a turning point where he felt the power of artificial intelligence and how it was really going to revolutionize the way products and businesses worked. So when he came back to Europe after that scholarship uh, in the US, he felt he needed to help businesses to really join and take advantage of this artificial intelligence revolution. After two years of studying and working as a freelancer, uh, together with his Fulbright fellow partner, uh, Nicolo, they founded AI Academy. Uh, and that's where he's working now to provide strategic and technical artificial intelligence consulting to the businesses and fulfill their mission. So now Jean-Luc is gonna take us through a very interesting presentation. And if you can uh, type your questions, we'll try to answer some of them at the end. Uh, or yeah, we'll have a short period at the end for any questions and answers you have. So now over to Jean-Luc, thanks. So thank you very much, Robert. It was a perfect introduction. And uh, as Robert was saying, I'm very happy for doing this. Uh, and the reason why is I do data science now the whole time. I do AI the whole time, but my roots my main background is in energy. So this feels like going back to my roots. Um, so without any further ado, let's start uh, with the contents. And uh, let me know if you're seeing correctly my screen. Uh, Robert, is, is all good? Yep, I got your slides. Hey, and I'm perfect. gonna present them to everyone. Perfect, so let, let's get started. So welcome to this webinar, first of all. We're gonna talk about AI and energy and how AI works and why it's gonna revolutionize the energy sector. Let's get started with something that I guess everybody knows. AI now is one of the most hyped technologies out there. And we're seeing AI researchers being used as testimonials for perfum campaigns. There are uh, companies advertising machine learning and artificial intelligence services on billboards on the highway. And there are companies that are using AI as a core distinctive feature of their products in uh, while advertising um, the, the, the new uh, launches. But we have to understand, how do we get to this AI hype? And this is really the question I asked myself when I was in Silicon Valley. Is this hype real or is it just a marketing stunt? If we want to understand this, we have to go back in time. We have to go back to the origins of artificial intelligence. So AI is not a recent, te a recent technology. The first time that someone theorized it was in 1955, when some researchers from the University of Dartmouth asked the Rockefeller Foundation to fund a summer project on artificial intelligence. And this uh, Dartmouth workshop was very ambitious, but it laid down some of the main uh, ideas that then uh, followed through the whole history of artificial intelligence. And one of them was that they had to tackle the problem of human intelligence, not um, tout court, so not taking the whole human intelligence and trying to make it uh, encode it into a computer, but go application by application, vertical by vertical. And the first vertical they started working on was human translation. 
And you can see in this picture on the bottom right, a punch card. And this punch card was used to translate English into Russian and the other way around. And the reason why uh, the government, the US government funded this research was that it was the beginning of the Cold War and there was a lot of need for translators from Russian to English and the other way around. And so this is, was the really first application of AI. Vertical, translation, English to Russian. Those guys, those researchers faced a series of problems. Uh, the first problem was lack of data. There just wasn't data available at that time. Second one was the computers were pretty slow at the time, so they didn't have computing power. And then the methods they were trying to use were basically all based on brute force, uh, which, you know, it's not very uh, efficient. It doesn't really work well. Um, so what happened was that in 1966, the US government said uh, to some researchers to go and, uh, and try to understand if their investments were going well uh, or not. And this is a sentence from this report that basically says that the machine couldn't understand what was translating. So the task was too difficult uh, and the results were really poor, were falling short uh, from the expectation that the government had in the beginning. This led to the first AI winter. What is the first AI winter? It's basically a period in time in which no one was uh, having hope and then it wasn't funding research for artificial intelligence. So it was um, really a period in which this technology wasn't uh, researched and there was no hope. In the 1980s, there was a new AI spring. So uh, companies, this time companies, not government, companies starting to invest in artificial intelligence with a different approach from before. They, were, they wanted to use something called expert systems. And this picture is actually an expert system. Let's see why it is. This is how an expert system works. We have a subject matter expert, can be a doctor, can be an engineer, uh, can be whatever, someone who knows exactly how a certain phenomenon works. And this guy, this person, explains how a phenomenon works to a computer programmer that encodes some rules into a computer in that sort of tree-based software. What does it mean that you have, for instance, in, in the slide before, you were seeing a doctor and a computer scientist. The doctor was saying to the computer scientist something like, okay, let's say I have a patient that says I have headache. Then I ask him, did you drink yesterday? If he says yes, then I ask him, uh, how much do you drink? If he says not a lot, then I ask him this, 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 blah, blah, blah. You understand what's the, what's the methodology? You're basically building a huge tree, decision tree, with all the possible cases uh, that, that could happen. And these methods, of course, have some problems. First of all, it's expensive, because you need computer scientists and domain experts work together maybe for months. So you need to hire not just computer scientists, but also doctors, engineers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of hard. Then it's very difficult to maintain debug and update. And why it is? Because we are, as I was saying before, we are taking hundreds of rules and trying to put them inside a computer. If you have a bug, go find it. It's pretty complicated. And lastly, which probably is the most uh, is the toughest problem to solve, is that they, they are extremely brittle. What does it mean, brittle? That if you if a situation occurs that wasn't taken in consideration in the beginning, the system just fails. It just knows what you explain the system. Okay. This led to what's called the second AI winter. This time was a commercial failure. It wasn't a, a stop of funding from the government. It was a commercial failure. In the beginning of the 20, 21st century. A series of huge shift happened, and we started to have new hope for artificial intelligence. Let's see what happened. First of all, we started, thanks to the internet, we started to generate a lot of data. And to give you an example, there's Hal Varian, is the chief economist at Google. He estimated that from the beginning of time until 2003, we produced five exabytes of data. That is five billion gigabytes of data. Nowadays, we are producing them every two days. This, this is crazy. It, it really freaks me out. 
everything we've produced from the beginning of time until 2003, now we do it in two days. This is a crazy, crazy acceleration in the amount of data we generate. And let's look at computing power. So in 1997, the most powerful computer was called the Ashi Red. And it was in Japan. Its power was 1.3 teraflops. You don't really need to know what a teraflop is. Just know that the higher, the better. Cost it $55 million. It was as big as an apartment. It's a big apartment, actually. Fast forward 20 years, and you can see this guy on the right is the CEO of NVIDIA. And in his hand, he's holding the NVIDIA Titan B. It's a 110 teraflops. 110. So almost 100 times more powerful than the computer on the left. Um, it's a graphical processing unit, a GPU. It costs just $3,000, and it's as big as you can see in the picture. It fits in one hand. Just 20 years, crazy acceleration in computing power uh, performances. And these two factors, a lot of cheap data and a lot of computing power, fuel the growth of a technology called machine learning and a particular kind of machine learning called deep learning. Let's see what happened with these new technologies. We had a huge acceleration in the results that we could get out of um, artificial intelligence. So just to give you a brief idea, in 1977, we got one of the first huge achievements. Everybody was celebrating newspapers, um, news channels. Everybody was talking about this. The a an AI from IBM beat the world chess champion. And just in the last two years, we reached all these milestones. AI, it's better than pocket players at playing poker. AI predicts leukemia better than some doctors. Matches human in speech recognition. Beats world Go champion. Go is a very complicated problem, uh, a game much more complicated than chess. And uh, beating humans in playing video games, in computer vision. We were able, in the last five years, let's say, to overcome a series of challenges that we couldn't tackle in the last 40. Those are the results. So what I really want you to understand from this section is that the AI revolution, it's real. It's not a marketing stunt, and it's due to some techno technological and economical factors. So for instance, a lot of cheap data available, a lot of cheap computing power available, and new powerful algorithms. These three things together are enabling, are fueling the AI revolution. Let's now understand what machine learning is. Because we just mentioned that it was one of the main reasons why the AI revolution got started. So uh, first of all, since basically every successful AI implementation is based on machine learning techniques, most times the two terms, artificial intelligence and machine learning, are confused or we use them as, uh, as the same thing, as synonyms. Let's understand now better what is machine learning. And this is the very first definition of machine learning. The field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. This is kind of uh, complicated to understand. So let's, let's try to let's go a little bit back. So let's see if we have to solve a problem with software in the traditional way, what will be the process? First of all, we need to understand the problem. So imagine you're like, for instance, writing an Excel sheet, okay? You're compiling a spreadsheet, you wanna compute something, you need to know exactly what you wanna compute and how to compute it. Then you write your little script, so you transform it basically into code that the machine can understand. And then the machine has finally, uh, it finally knows how to solve the problem because you explained the machine how to do so. But is it really how we learn? I mean, this is how computers work, but it's not how humans work. Um, I don't know you guys, but I didn't learn how to walk with my mother explaining me all the different steps or how to move legs, how to move uh, my feet, etc. This is not how we do. So let's make machines learn like we do. So by experience. And let's see how this process changes. This will be the new approach with machine learning. First, we get just some data that describes the problem that we are trying to solve. Then we feed it into a computer, and the computer trains, trains itself. It learns 
from the data and it understands how the problem works. And now the machine can solve the problem. So we are not feeding the computer with some specific rules. We are feeding him with data and the computer finds out the rules. Let's see it in, in, in this way, more graphical, seeing the difference between traditional, let's call it traditional programming and machine learning. In traditional programming, we are feeding the computer with functions, so how to solve a problem, rules, and with data. And the computer, what it does is basically just apply the functions we just told, we just explained, let's say the computer, it applies this function to the data, and it produces a certain output. With machine learning, what we are doing it's, it's completely different. We are feeding the computer with data and with the output we want to get. The computer, thanks to machine learning algorithms, is going to come out with functions. So the rules are extrapolated by the computer. They are not fed into the computer. And this is a crazy, crazy, crazy uh, advantage in certain cases. Let's see why. <laughs> this is a sentence I always like to to put. It's uh, uh, researchers in uh, natural language processing and speech recognition. He said that every time he fought the linguist, the performance of the recognizer went up. What does he mean? It means that basically in certain very complicated problems, uh, it's they are very complex to, to explain, you know? So language, the human language is very complicated to uh, explain in specific rules. In these cases, applying machine learning, so letting the computer figure out by himself what, that, what the rules are. It's way better than just trying to encode them. And this is how it will work. And then we're gonna see why this is better in certain cases than let's say traditional programming. This first uh, case, it's called supervised learning and it's a subset of machine learning. So it's a subset of what I was trying to explain you before. How does it work? We are taking a certain amount of uh, data points so or basically examples that we are feeding the computer with and we are taking a certain amount of features features are representations of the of the problem okay so for instance a feature of um let's say of uh, the uh, photovoltaic panel consumption could be the amount of sun it's receiving it could be uh, how dirty it is and then we are taking all these informations and we are matching them to a label. In the case of the photovoltaic panel, this could be how much the, uh, the panel is consuming. What's the consumption of the panel? Uh, we're gonna see more examples now. What I really want you to understand now is that in this um, kind of machine learning called supervised learning, we are taking a phenomenon that is described by some features. We're taking some examples that we call data points, and we are feeding them uh, we, we are like we are matching them with a with a with a label so with a final output deep learning has more or less the same kind of idea but instead of taking features so instead of basically um uh, in the case of photovoltaic panels instead of taking uh, uh stuff like the how how dirty it is or uh, how dirty the, the the pv panel is or how much the sun is going direct into the panel Deep learning does everything by itself. Uh, I don't want to go too much too deep into this because it's probably not very important now. I just want you to understand the basic concepts. Uh, but just so that when you read around uh, deep learning, you know that it's something that works exactly like machine learning, but it's more powerful because you don't need to do this part of feature extraction. So basically, uh, you don't need to select here all these different um, uh, things. And, uh, and, and this is very important, for instance, if you're trying to do image recognition, because if you're doing image recognition, it's kind of hard, you know, from a picture of a dog, for instance, to say, this, these are the ears of the dog, this is the nose of the dog, you're just taking the picture and feeding into the algorithm. And this is deep learning. So I want you to know, it's the same thing as most machine learning algorithms, it's just a bit more powerful, because it can do this uh, feature extraction part by itself. And there are pros and cons. The pros is that it's basically magic. So it allows you to do uh, stuff in a very, very, um, you're basically just letting the, the machine do everything by itself, okay? And, and this is one of the technologies that allowed uh, image recognition performances to go up by a lot recently. It also has some problems, so it needs a lot of data. 
and it's a lot of computing power. And it's tough to explain the model. How it's tough, let's say, when the model gives you an output to understand why it gave you this exact output. If this is not yet very clear to you, don't worry. Um, I know it can be tough to understand in the beginning, but we have some cool examples later on in the energy market that are going to help you understand this better. Now, my goal is to give you a brief overview of how these things work and, and what are the basic principles behind them. So this is the, the machine learning process. And this hopefully is going to already help you a little bit. There's a first part that is called learning. So basically, we are taking data and giving it to an algorithm. The algorithm learns. It's basically learning from this data. It's learning these functions I was talking to you uh, about before. And then there's a part called inference. So we are asking a question to the algorithm that has learned some stuff from, from the data we gave him. And then it's going to make predictions with a classic example of a cat and dog recognizer, we are giving to the algorithm some pictures of cats, and we're saying them, this is a cat, and we're pictures of dogs, and we're saying the algorithm, this is a dog. So in, in, in the example we made before, this picture will be the data point, and this is the label, okay? So we're taking this data point, this example is a cat. This one, it's also a cat. This one is a dog, and this one is a dog. The algorithm learns, and when it learned, it can do the last part of the game, which is called inference. Inference basically means that then if we give him another picture, and we don't tell him anything about it, we just give him the picture, we ask, what is this? And the algorithm, if it trained properly, is going to answer, it's a dog. So the algorithm has learned from these examples on the left, and it's able to make predictions on new examples. There's another kind of machine learning called unsupervised learning, which basically allows you to take some unstructured data. So we're just giving the algorithm some data points, and algorithm is going to find some clusters. So it's basically going to group these points into a different uh, in different groups that are separated. We're going to see an example later on also of this that is going to make everything much more clear. Let's talk now about the state of the art of the artificial intelligence. So we've seen how this works, the basic principles. Let's see what we can do now in general. So this is not going to be applied to the energy market yet, but it gives you an idea of what's possible today. So first of all, uh, there are two categories of AI applications. One of them is taking decisions based on large amounts of data. And that can be, for instance, the example I was making before. So modeling the consumption of a photovoltaic panel. And the second kind of application uh, these human-like tasks, like vision, speech, and these kind of things uh, that humans are very, very good at. Let's take the, 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 the second part, so the human-like tasks, for instance, computer visions. And this is uh, an example of the error rate we could get on a data set called ImageNet. ImageNet is a data set of 14 million pictures. And it's one of the best benchmarks for uh, computer visions. So what does it mean? It means that uh, a lot of researchers are using uh, ImageNet to compare their algorithms. And this is exactly what I was telling you before. In 2010, our error rate on, on these tasks was around 30%, just seven years ago. Between 2010 and 2015, thanks to data, new algorithms, and these kind of things, we were able to get to human level precision. And what I mean by human level precision is that this ImageNet uh, data set has very complicated pictures. I mean, some pictures are not like dog and cat. There are different breeds of dogs. And, and it's very hard also for a human to understand if, uh, certain kinds of dog breeds, for instance. And these algorithms are already better than humans. The human uh, error rate is around 5%. And the algorithms of today achieve 3.6% error rate. This is the best algorithm that there is um, so far. So we're already better than humans in computer vision. And this is an example of how precise these algorithms get. As you can see, for instance, this example, this is not just a ship. It's a container ship, and an algorithm is capable of understanding with this precision what what is in the in the in the in, in the picture. 
speech recognition, and this is also another example that allows you to understand how the recent times, the deep learning and the, all the data we were able to collect is helping us big time in improving the performances. Uh, basically, we were at a stale from 2010 to 2000, from sorry, from 2000 to 2010. We couldn't make our algorithms better. From 2010 on, we were able to improve the accuracy of these systems, speech recognition systems, to basically match human accuracy. And this happened all in five years. Reasoning. So what does it mean, reasoning? It means basically trying to solve problems that require some sort of uh, thought. And for instance, here we have an example of chess. Okay, uh, chess is one of these games in which you have to think a lot, you know. And uh, we already bait humans in in, in playing uh, chess in 1977. And uh, what's interesting is that when when this happened, um, sorry, 1997, uh, when this happened, um, the New York Times said, "Yeah, okay, we we bait, we we've been beating humans at chess, but uh, no way we're gonna beat humans at Go." Go, it's a game, um, it's a Chinese game that is much more complicated than chess. And the New York Times said it may be 100 years before computer beats humans at Go. Guess what happened 16, uh, no, sorry, 19 years later? Um, Google built a computer program called AlphaGo that was able to beat the world uh, master of Go, so the best player of Go, uh, not just one time, several times. So we are already better than humans at playing this complicated game. So it's reasoning uh, with the rules of this game. And the New York Times had to write, <laughs> Master of Go board game is walloped by Google computer program, which is kind of uh, interesting. Just 19 years later. So text to speech, what does it mean text to speech? Make a computer talk uh, like a human being. And uh, this is um, an algorithm that Google released uh, last month, actually, uh, or a couple of months ago. It's called Tacotron 2. And uh, here I have some examples, and um, I'd love to play them for you. And some of them are recording of a human, and some of them are recording of, uh, are made by this Tacotron 2. And what's interesting is that, at least me, I cannot really understand which one, uh, which is which. And uh, let's, let's hear them. That girl did a video about Star Wars lipstick. That girl did a video about Star Wars lipstick. It's very complicated to understand which one is a human uh, and which one is a robot. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. George Washington was the first president of the United States. George Washington was the first president of the United States. It's very complicated. I'm too busy for romance. I'm too busy for romance. So, as you can see, it's very convincing. Uh, so our algorithms are already kind of uh, as good as humans in talking, basically. And now it's a matter of uh, engineering them. So this algorithm, for instance, it's, it's very heavy to, to handle, um, meaning that it's pretty slow. But the performances are already, already very, very convincing. So AI has reached humans also in talking. Let's now go deep into AI and energy. And let's see what are these opportunities. So we've seen how machine learning works, um, how AI works. We've seen the state of art AI, general applications. Now we wanna see how all this stuff relates to the energy sector. So energy sector investments in big data and artificial intelligence have ballooned by a factor of 10 this year. This is according to a new report by the accountancy firm BDO. Um, and the firm found that mergers and acquisitions involving energy companies and AI startups had soared in average value from around 500 million in the first quarter of 2017 to 3.5 billion in the second quarter. This trend uh, is from one side boosted by the great increase in AI startups for the reasons we mentioned before. So data, computing power, new tools, new algorithms. But what are the motivations behind the acquisitions from the energy market side? So what are the energy-related problems that these successful startups were addressing? So the energy market is facing completely new challenges, as we know, and many of them can be toggled with artificial intelligence. Now we're going to see why AI is a killer tool to solve them. So one of them is demand response management and renewables forecasting. Um, this is the 
basic equation of uh, of of energy in general. You need to match the demand and the and, and the production. And before renewables, this was kind of easy because you had the demand that is volatile. You need to predict it, and the fossil production is something you can just adjust based on how you uh, how you predict the demand. Let's see what happens when we add renewables to this scenario. We have the demand that is volatile, the renewables that are, are also volatile, and then you can plan accordingly just the fossil production. So we are adding a new unpredictability source in this equation, uh, which, which, you know, it's, it's pretty complicated and it's, it's a mess because if you uh, break this equation, you can have some very high risks and some very high costs related to that. And uh, there's a paper, um, it's a pretty old paper, but it still works today, that says that a 1% increase in forecasting error in the UK case was able to, uh, to cause a cost of 10 million pounds uh, for, for, the, for utilities. So it, it's very important. And, uh, and, and notice that this is, not, uh, this is not an engineering problem, it's a data problem. It's a forecasting problem. And AI can help big time in doing this, in solving this problem. Let's see how, with machine learning. This is a classic supervised learning example. So we can take features, so what we want to learn from, for instance, uh, temperature, humidity, location, clouds, uh, the color of the PV panel, that it's a proxy basically for how dirty it is, shadow on the PV panel. And then we can map it to the label, so to the, uh, photovoltaic panel energy production. And the machine learning algorithm can map the two things and find out a relation for which we can, for every possible future state, predict how much the photovoltaic panel is gonna produce in terms of energy. And this way we make renewables more predictable and, and therefore it's, it's easier to, to install them. On the demand side, we can do the same thing. We can improve forecasting uh, accuracy also on the demand side. So we can have some several features like occupancy, some radiation, temperature, time of day, uh, the day of the week, of the month, of the year, the lightning inside the building. Thanks to a machine learning algorithm, we can model the building consumption. And I, I made the example of a building because it's a little bit easier to, to, to grasp because we can have all these sensors inside the buildings. And, uh, and with the machine learning algorithm, we can therefore predict how much each building is going to consume. And this is more related to um, a small case. So for instance, a company wants to save energy, uh, but it can be extended, uh, let's say nationwide to uh, predict how much a group of buildings, like, like, a, half, like a, a whole city or, or a whole region, a whole country is gonna, is gonna consume the day after. Of course, different features, different labels, but it's the same concept. And what I want you to understand is this, machine learning can help us model this kind of Phenomena. Another um, energy challenge that AI can solve uh, pretty well is energy saving and resources optimization. And I'm talking about these two cases in the same um, section, and uh, because they are pretty similar. And let's see, let's see how. So this is a um, classical example from Google of energy saving. Uh, by classical, I mean there is a classical approach, and what they've done was taking all different features, these ones are features, okay? So the IT load, pump speed, chillers, some features from the chillers, some temperatures, and they used, this is called a neural network, it's a supervised learning algorithm to model the PUE of the data center. The PUE is the ratio between the total facility energy and the IT equipment energy. The results of this uh, approach, so to basically take a data center model the consumption of the data center through uh, machine learning algorithms and then optimizing this approach led google to saving 40 percent consumption 40 percent it's crazy they didn't change anything in the data center in terms of um machines in terms of hvac system they just modeled it through machine learning and then optimized it so it can help you save energy big time. It can also help you optimize resources. So for instance, if you have a machine, you can um, measure different features. Again, these are called features. So vibrations of the machine, temperature of the machine, 
speed, how much energy is consuming, and you can map it to a label. It's, it's the state of the machine, if it's a fault or a, a faulty state or not a faulty state. And if you can map these two things, you can predict when the machine is going to break. This way, you're going to optimize your maintenance and reduce costs. The advantages of this, uh, of this system is that energy saving is done with existing machines. So as I was saying before in the Google example, there's no investments in new machines uh, needed. And the second thing is that you don't need to understand the physics of your system. Uh, data is going to do it for you. You know, Google, in their example, they said that they were able to uh, account for very complex um, phenomena, like, for instance, the wind going outside from the data center and model then the heat exchange between the data center and the outside world, which you can do that with physics, but it's not very precise because you have to lay on assumptions. It's, it's, it's something that it's not optimal. Machine learning doesn't really care about all these things. It just learns from data and finds out how this stuff works. And the last uh, factor, last but not least, because this is very important, is that machine learning algorithms learn from data so they adapt as situations change. And this means that if your machines are, for instance, getting a little bit older and they start working in a different way because maybe their performances is not the same anymore, your algorithm is going to find that out and is going to adapt to that. So your uh, energy optimizing model is going to be always, always uh, representing the real functioning state of your machine and not just some uh, physics that you came up with in the beginning of time that then is not respected anymore because your machine got old and started working a bit differently. Last but not least, uh, better insights. The energy market is getting deregulated and utilities have to work with customers in a different way. They have to know them better. And this is a case of energy uh, clustering, so unsupervised learning. I promised you guys I'm gonna, I was going to give you some examples of this. And this is um, an example from Opower. It's a company that was acquired by Oracle, uh, I think in 2016, for something like $500 million. And they started from this kind of data. So this is uh, what data scientists called a hairball. So it's a thousand different load profiles from customers just laid out on a graph. And as you can see, I mean, it's pretty complicated to find some pattern or to understand something from this graph. Thanks to unsupervised algorithms, they were able to transform these into these. They found five different energy consumption profiles. And you can see here, you have, for instance, this orange uh, profile that is people that consume energy late at night. You can see. Then there's this uh, gray one that they call the coffee makers because these people wake up early in the morning. They probably brew coffee since they, the, their consumption rises very fast. Then they leave home. Probably they are going to work. And then they come back at night and start consuming energy again. There's the blue one is the steady guys. And, uh, you know, you have a lot of more information than uh, what you was able to get from these. Okay. And what you can do with these is know better your customers, uh, engage them into demand response uh, programs, or you can uh, you can give them the best offer based on how they consume energy. You can do really a lot of interesting things with this kind of approach. Let's now look at some real world case studies. So those are uh, the startups and scale ups that used energy, uh, they used artificial intelligence in the energy market successfully. So this is Brain is a French scale up um, that is in the portfolio of Inno Energy. And let's see uh, something they've done that is really interesting. So the initial scenario, they, they had this customer was one of the biggest nuclear facilities in the world. And what they had to do was to uh, basically take the waste, the nuclear waste from nuclear power plants and transform it to make it uh, possible to uh, safely um, store, basically. And in order to do so, they needed a lot of steam for industrial processes. So they had five boilers, five huge boilers, and those boilers were producing steam. This steam was going to be used for 15 different industrial processes. And uh, 10 million euros were spent each year to generate steam for these processes. 
And in, the, in this initial scenario, before DC brain came in, uh, the amount of steam to produce, it was determined just by considering the amount of material to process. So there was not a very robust way of understanding how much steam was had to be used. Let's see what DC brain has done and how they used machine learning to improve the situation. First step they've done was to model the steam consumption. So what they've done was, this is again an example of supervised learning. They've taken some features that uh, are relevant to the to the steam consumption, to, the, to how much steam the plant needed. For instance, it could be the amount of material to process, the time of the year, um, a lot of different kind of uh, needs, also the temperature maybe. And then they used, uh, the label was the steam consumption. And they used a deep neural network, so deep learning as I mentioned before, to model this, the behavior of the, of the plant. So they were able for any given day to, uh, understand and to predict how much steam the plant was gonna need. This is the first step. Second step, they've done the same kind of process. It's always supervised learning. They always use deep neural networks and they try to model the boiler yield, uh, which means that they, they basically to take in some, uh, they have taken some features that uh, describe how the boiler was working. So for instance, pressure, temperature, etc., And they model the yield uh, of the boiler using deep neural nets. Second step. Third step, and this is the core of the DC brain technology, they were able to put all this information together and represent the asset as a whole. And once they, uh, once they had this, they were able then to optimize the, the, the how to use these boilers in order to save energy and always produce the right amount of steam with the best amount, uh, with the best, sorry, best combination of boilers to save energy uh, as much as they could. So last step, best mix of boilers according to energy prices, the steam needed and the yields of the boilers. And guess what they were able to achieve? Minus 1 million per year, 10%. Um, this is the amount of savings that DC brain was able to get with their model. Notice that the, the, the nuclear power plant didn't have to invest money in new boilers or new uh, expensive uh, machines. They just had to use DC brain and their uh, really advanced machine learning models and, and their process, most of all, uh, to, to optimize what they already had. So this is kind of crazy and it's very, very effective. Another case study from a Spanish company called SmartType, uh, that's a scale up, uh, sorry, a startup, and they do uh, predictive maintenance on wind uh, farms. So this is a, a number that it's pretty shocking. Nine billions per year are wasted to the failures in wind turbines. And this is due to production losses and maintenance costs. So if the wind, uh, if a wind turbine breaks or can't work at a certain time, um, because maybe it's in an unhealthy state, it didn't break 100%, but it can't produce energy. Of course, you have some cost because you need to repair it, but also you have production losses. And the sum of these two things, it's nine, amounts to nine billion dollars spent each year. So smart type approach was to combine different machine learning and statistical tools, uh, these different machine learning algorithms and statistical tools to come up with a decision algorithm that can predict whether a certain wind turbine is in a faulty state or not a faulty state. And then the company who owns the wind, uh, the wind farm can act and, and, and basically, uh, without, instead of waiting for the problem to happen, you know it in advance. And so you can take different decisions and, and save money. So this is an example of the statistical analysis they've used. Uh, so they have a different, um, they have uh, the estimation of the of the how the, the the wind farm the wind turbine was gonna work, and they set some thresholds based on statistical analysis on where to give an alarm or where to give a, just a warning, and um, and this is an example of the clustering algorithm they've used. So you can see the red dots are the alarm uh, states, and the, these squares are the unhealthy states, while the triangles are the healthy states. And uh, of course, here you need to visualize it in, with just two, uh, two parameters plotted. 
but you can do that with a multi-dimensional situation. So, uh, of course, this is a, just a representation. The algorithm is much more complex, uh, but it gives you an idea of uh, what they do. And they mix all these different machine learning uh, and statistical tools. Uh, and what did they come up with? They were able to make companies save 10, uh, 20% uh, in, in, in money, in real expenditure, uh, because of uh, reduced downtime and reduced maintenance and reduced components replacements. So I want to leave you with some closing thoughts and practical advices. So first of all, AI is now democratic. You can see in this picture, this guy is called George Hotz. He was a hacker and he founded a company called Coma.ai. And this company builds self-driving cars. And he used, uh, as you can see here, it's kind of crazy. There's this small camera uh, behind the rear view mirror. It's just parts that he bought on Alibaba. And in one year, he was able to build a self-driving car completely by himself. Uh, this is crazy considering that just 10 years ago, uh, DARPA is the military research organization for the United States. They uh, induced, uh, they started a challenge called uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge, and uh, they invited different top universities to try to make self driving cars. They worked in the desert and they failed. They were able to make just, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, seven miles out of 150. And this guy by himself, just one person, out of a garage in San Francisco was able to make a self driving car. So AI is now democratic, thanks to everything we've said earlier. So cheap data, a lot of data, cheap computing power, and new tools and new methods. Another thought I want you to think about and I want you to always have in the back of your head is that data is king. So building a unique data asset is a great way to create value and it's very protectable. So if you don't have the right data, your algorithms are not gonna work. The best algorithm, algorithm with a few data or with uh, data that is not clean and it's not uh, um, collected strategically to, to, to pursue a certain AI function uh, is, is not just not gonna work. So data is king, you have to focus on this. And this works whatever company we're talking to. It works if you're a startup, it works if you're a corporate. If your data is not uh, fit for a certain scope and it's not enough, you have big problems, okay? So data is king. Let's see now what's in it for startups. So let's say you're a startup and you wanna invest in AI. Why should you do that? Well, first of all, there's a lot of investment going on. And uh, I don't think I have to comment on this picture. The trend is pretty clear. There's a lot of funding for AI startups. And this is even more interesting. There's a very rich M&A environment. So a lot of companies are acquiring AI companies. And this is for general AI companies, uh, but uh, I already showed this graph before, but it's very interesting what's going on in the energy market. This is specific for the energy market. So a lot of uh, big energy utilities, big energy corporates are getting very interested in, in acquiring uh, AI startups because of their technology. So what are the tips that a startup should follow in order to, um, in order to, to, to get some, uh, to get something out of the, of AI? Two things. First thing, go vertical, focus on a niche, build an amazing data set and dominate your market. So if you try to um, make a very broad AI application, you're probably going to have problems, problems collecting data, probably have going to have some problems in making it work. Um, probably. And second thing you should do is, uh, you could do, depending on your application, of course, is to partner up with utilities. Uh, utilities often, often have a lot of data and a model that I've seen used by many startups is to partner with them. So they give you your data, you give them your AI based services and it creates a lot of values. There are a lot of companies that are doing this successfully. And Smart Type is an example, DC Brain is another one. So let's see instead a corporate, what a corporate should do. First of all, focus on people. Finding AI talents is very hard and retaining them is even harder. The reason why is that there are companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, that are really, really interested in getting these talents. They're paying them a lot and you need to compete with them to have the best talents. Second thing you need to do is to have a strong AI and business synergy. 
So sometimes I see when I go in companies um, that people that have to do AI, so data scientists and uh, ML researchers, have problems in talking with the business functions. And the business functions don't talk the language of the ML, uh, of the machine learning researcher. And the machine learning researcher doesn't talk the language of the business. And, and this creates problems. So try to create a synergy between your data science team and your business. And the third uh, factor that is very important, uh, me as a data scientist, I really, really uh, um, point the finger to this, allow fast iter iterations. What does it mean? Is that when you're building AI, sometimes, I mean, uh, often, uh, I would say always, you have to go through iterations. So you need to make the assumptions, test them, and you need to do them fast. If I'm a data scientist and I have to wait five months to get a simple data set, I'm going to be frustrated and probably going to leave the company. So allow fast iterations for your data scientist. I'm gonna, I want to leave you with a, with a sentence by Andrew Ng. He was a researcher at Google. Now he's the uh, head of science at Baidu, that is uh, China's Google. He said that AI is the new electricity. And just as 10 years ago, electricity transformed the industry at the industry, AI will now do the same. And I hope that with this uh, hour we spent together, I gave you some uh, ideas on why it is, why this is the right moment to invest in artificial intelligence, how it works, and what are the reasons why this, is, uh, this technology can definitely help a big time the energy market, as well as some other markets that we already seen um, being disrupted by this technology. So thank you for joining this webinar. And we'd love to hear your feedback. So there's this link, bit.ly slash AI for energy, where there is a feedback form. And Robert just told me that I need to open remissions on the feedback form. So if it doesn't work now, it's going to work uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And uh, thank you for, the, for, the, for joining in. Thank you for listening. And if you have some questions, I'll be very happy to, to address them. So let me now turn on my webcam. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. John Luca. John Luca. Really interesting. interesting. Okay, other, other questions? Yeah, we have two questions so far. Cool. Uh, one was from one of our community representatives, Felix, and it was about your uh, Google case study. He was wondering in the case of Google, how did they optimize their energy consumption if they did not change the machine itself? Did they adjust the building's ventilation? to the processing time of the machines? Yeah, so what they're able to do is, you know, let, let's let's say uh, let's say you don't have an AI algorithm, okay? And you want to test different set points, you want to test different things on your machines. Uh, you want to test maybe the pressure of some pumps, you want to test the set points, you want to test several things. How can you do that? You cannot just go there and, 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 and switch knobs and make tests one after the other. And, um, on the other hand, if you build a model that perfectly represents the how the system works, it perfectly represents how the building works, it represents how the chillers works, uh, it represents everything of your system, you can basically do um, some sort of sensitivity analysis. So you can test a million different scenarios and you find out for each scenario what is the best set point of the chillers, best set points of the pumps. Uh, you, you can find out what, what's the best uh, combinations of everything at any given time. So this is really the, the, the core idea. And in fact, they call this kind of applications the digital twin, because you're, ba you're building a digital twin of your real asset, but in, in a digital way. And once it's digital, you can, you can run all the tests you want and find out the best uh, settings and the best uh, um, combinations of things in order to save energy. Uh, let me know if, if my answer is clear. Okay, yeah, it sounds clear to me. And if anyone else has another question, they can type it now in the chat uh, in the YouTube link. There was one more from uh, Pritam. He was saying in developing countries where there is no infrastructure to capture the required data, how should one approach this problem? Okay, so this is a very, very interesting question. And thank you for this. So, uh, actually, I think AI, in this case, in developing countries, AI is not a problem to build, but it's instead a good asset. I've read a lot of papers. Uh, there was, they were basically addressing the problem of how to uh, predict 
was the best place to install a uh, um, solar farm, okay? And he was saying that in developing countries, most of the times you don't have the money to, uh, to install expensive equipment to measure uh, solar radiation and stuff. So what these guys have done was to uh, install just one of these, of these, of these uh, expensive uh, sensors and then build an AI model that was able to predict how much energy it was able to uh, output from a solar farm uh, just using basic information. Uh, what do I mean? That you, you basically collected like a wind speed, uh, temperature, uh, humidity, pressure, and map them to the to the output of the of the solar farm, and they've done it with once with the expensive equipment, and then they just threw out the expensive equipment and use the AI model to use uh, to predict how much energy was gonna uh, produce just using uh, basic informations like temperature, humidity, and pressure. So the output was that they were able to predict how much they were gonna produce just with cheap equipment. They were able to put it all in the North Africa and, and, and make these predictions and, and find the best place to put the, the PV panels, just using these simple informations. Um, I've seen a lot of times using AI to basically throw out some, uh, some sensors. And instead of using sensor, you're just using artificial intelligence. And uh, it, it works quite well. There are a lot of companies that are doing this. And it can help you basically uh, have information some places in which you don't have the sensors i hope my answer was was clear this is just an example i mean the the sky is the limit so uh, when, when you know how it works you can you can just uh, have all the ideas you want and i'm sure there are other use cases that, that no one has thought uh, or thought of yet okay let's take our last question then for today uh thank you uh julia for asking it uh and she's wondering do you know if machine learning has been applied already to make more efficient DR in the residential sector, except from the load profiles you mentioned? Uh, some more uh, precise DR, demand response, you mean? Yes. Okay, yeah, now no, no, I read, the, no, read the, the question. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've read, I read a few papers. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, about some industrial applications, I mean, some real world applications. I think Hope Power, no, yeah, Hope Power has, has done something like this now that I think about it. Um, so, what they've done, you've seen the graphs I showed you before, okay? So, you've seen these, uh, these uh, hairball of all these users that all these consumptions, and Hope Power was able to cluster these users into groups. And then they have a very strong expertise in behavioral change. So if the utilities needed, for instance, you have users that have high peaks in a certain time of the day, and you need these users to maybe uh, smooth a little bit their peak so that the, the consumption is more flat and, and for the utilities it's easier to, to answer the, uh, to match the, 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 the demand, okay? You, they could identify those clusters and send them uh, personalized uh, offers. They will trigger them with notifications on, on, on uh, mobile apps. And in this way, they shifted users that have, let's say, uh, uncomfortable for the utilities point of view, energy consumption shapes. They will switch them to other consumption shapes and have a more flat uh, demand, overall demand of energy from the whole users. And yeah, now that I think about it, this is one of the cases that has already worked, has already been put in place. But there are a lot of uh, papers uh, that study these applied in, more, in smaller residential uh, areas in which you can predict how much users are going to consume. And then you can try to uh, modify their, their consumption in different ways, with different incentives, and, and try to have a flatter uh, demand curve, basically. And so, yeah, definitely there are applications and we're going to see more of them uh, in the future as, you know, smart meters are getting more uh, and more diffused and this technology is getting more and more accessible. Great, thanks. Uh, we had a few more questions come in, but I'm afraid we're running out of time for today. Um, so why don't we continue the conversation uh, about these on the community platform? So if those uh, that have the questions that are still pending, 
can write those in the smart cities uh, part of the community platform. I'll pass them along to Jean-Luca and see if he can respond to those uh, when he has a moment. Uh, I really hope this is just the beginning of our work uh, with Jean-Luca because I think he has a lot uh, to teach us and already has taught us a lot today. So thank you again so much for your time. Uh, okay. we, we look forward to having this recording um, ready uh, and to share uh, for people. Uh, and we'll also be asking you for a bit of feedback um, when you have a chance as well. So thanks everyone for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye now.